Good evening and welcome to Crosstalks. Tonight we are live from Stockholm University, where we will engage in three different topics with a great group of distinguished guests. To those of you watching all over the world, you will tonight have the opportunity to ask questions of our guests attending here in the studio and over Skype. Just use your own Skype account and call us on Crosstalks TV, and we will do our very best to patch you through. What is the future of mankind in the universe? We ask a philosopher, an astronomer, and an experimental physicist. We'll talk about the role of cities in the societies of tomorrow, and we're starting the evening off with the revolution in the life sciences technology. With me to discuss the future of medicine are Professor Wouter van der Weinhardt from the KTH Royal School of Technology here in Stockholm, where he is leading bio, micro and nanofluidics research at the Microsystems Technology Lab and is director of the Life Science Technologies Platform. Welcome. Thank you. Professor Gunnar van Heine leads the Center for Biomembrane Research at Stockholm University and has served as chairman of the Nobel Committee in Chemistry. Welcome. Jochen Schwenk is Associate Professor in Translational Proteomics and also uh, manages the Biobank Profiling F Facility at the Science for Life Laboratory at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome. And uh, joining us via Skype is Susan Lindquist, Professor of Biology at MIT. She is also a member of the Whitehead Institute and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking each of you, in your respective fields of research, what is to you the most exciting frontier? Uh, let's start with Gunnar. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so, my own research is, um, deals with molecules inside cells. Uh, I think, though, that the most exciting life science area right now, and certainly for the next 10 years or 20 years, is, is neuroscience. What happens in, in neural cells, what happens in our brains, how do we describe that? Um, and it, you know, it's a very interesting uh, two-prong approach, because we have all the molecular sciences dealing with what happens inside neurons, what are the molecules, how do neurons connect, on the one hand, and then on the other hand we have psychology, who is dealing with, you know, the people there deal with the brain uh, characterizing how the brain takes, up, takes in information, processes information, interprets information, and places us in, in, you know, in an environment somehow. So we're in uh, a situation where the sort of natural science world will have a, a, is very soon or already applicable to everyday, um, everyday life. I don't think we're there very soon, and that's what makes it so exciting, because you know, there is this big rift between the top-down approach of psychology and the bottom-up approach of the molecular sciences. And I think we're still a far cry away from, from merging the two, right? And, mm -hmm. and I don't know, uh, Susan, you're much closer to neurobiology than I am. I don't know what, if you would agree on this or if you have a completely different view on I, things. Oh, I, I think it, we, I agree with you 100% we're at an extraordinarily uh, exciting time. Uh, it's an absolute frontier in every direction we look. Uh, the, the excitement of understanding how a brain works, how, how thought happens, um, how these extraordinary brains we have process all the information and create new knowledge. Uh, it's, it's just really quite remarkable how we learn. But I, I, the um, area of uh, neurological research that I have been delving into lately has been what happens when it goes wrong. So. Um, uh, that's actually also becoming an exciting frontier now. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases have been uh, uh, such a scourge of mankind, and as we have uh, lived longer and longer lives with all the advances and remarkable advances of science in the last century, we've, we've doubled the uh, human life expectancy. We're now living longer, and the, the bad side of that is that uh, neurodegenerative diseases are waiting for us out there. And... Um, it, when I first started uh, taking what was a very basic science approach to understanding protein folding and starting to see, well, what, can we understand what's going wrong when these proteins are clogging up the brains and can we make, make some headway in that? At first, I really, really, really found it so depressing because we were, it seemed that it was just going to be forever before we could, we'd ever solve the problem. But with the new tools of biotechnology um, 
and the new insights on the genome and uh, new levels of understanding Im imaging of the brain and, and how neurons are connected to each other, those, those basic frontiers are actually helping also to empower, I think, uh, a new uh, way of approaching um, th this, um, this very, very large uh, problem that, that will be an economic disaster for us if we don't solve it. Mm. Uh, how about Jochen? Yeah, I think my view is really uh, using, for instance, the name of the facility that um, I'm working for. So biobank profiling, so meaning biobank is a collection of many samples from a population. So to really involve a population in research, to make it aware of okay, activities within research, but also to, co to connect with other scientists, um, epidemiologists that understand you know, diseases on a more global scale. I think uh, neurodegenerative diseases, of course, are very important since we, as Susan said, grow older. Cancer is, of course, always an issue, cardiovascular diseases. And then um, using the technologies that we are working on uh, in the lab, using the reagents that are made within the project that we connected to, to yeah, generate new information and hopefully at some point to find new clues about how to diagnose a disease early, to be able to treat it, to understand it better. And of course, since we use the blood as the, the source of information, that is connected to every organ, so we, we have a, some sort of more system, a systemic view on a human being. So that's, of course, a, a great challenge to understand that and connect it. This is one of, the, sorry, yep. one of the most extraordinary things that I've witnessed in my time in science has been how this global community has come together and how, how engineers and clinicians and biologists and just people who used to work kind of very separately from each other are now interacting and, and, and creating, you know, really new synergies and, 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 and excitement in, in ways that as, as, a, as a human being doing science, I find that very exciting too. Both are just nodding frenetically. Yes, very much. Uh, and it's one of the big challenges also, too. I think that engineering and medicine perhaps have grown separate for a long time, where engineering gets more and more specialized in technical high schools. And we really have to find a way back and interact with the medical people to understand how can we use technologies in medicine and how can we, yeah, that would be the, the, one of the major challenges we're focused on. I think what you've all established here is that it's, all, it's almost like peeking over this hill and seeing this vast landscape. And, and I'm just, I think we need to sort of narrow down a little bit more what's happening right now. So if we just go a little bit back, Gunnar, could you just briefly describe some of the major science breakthroughs that have led us to this point? And then let's try and see what everybody's mm -hmm. doing to see yeah, where we well, are now. Um, of course, we're in the midst of, of, of an explosion in biological knowledge. That's for sure. And, and a lot of it is because of this merger between technology, biology, computer science, and physics. Um, on the other hand, I think we have to be a little bit humble and, and look back, because the really big breakthroughs in biology, I think, so far, date back you know, more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I'm thinking about the theory of evolution, Charles Darwin, what is it, 1859 or something, origin of species. I mean, that is the one humongous breakthrough in biology, I think, that you know, has permeates every aspect of biology as we understand it today. Mm. So that's absolutely the, key, the, corner, the keystone to the whole uh, edifice of biology. And then along the way, there is another big breakthrough, which is the, the nature of the genetic material. How can heredity, genetic heredity be passed on from generations? And that is, of course, the discovery that DNA is you know, the material basis, the molecule that encodes um, the genetic information and, and epitomized by the discovery of, of Crick and Watson, their model for the double helix of the DNA. So in some sense, although we have all these fantastic, sophisticated technology and we're producing all this amazing knowledge now, in a way we're just kind of trying to work out the implications of these, you know, really big breakthroughs. Uh, it's 60 years since, since the DNA molecule uh, structure of the DNA was, was um, proposed, right? And I think we're still just dealing with the implications of that, although we're doing it very, in, in much more sophisticated ways than, than we, what we could before. Um, then let's jump to something that's being done right now, because Votor, you've brought us something. Could you just show us what you got there? Something that was, that's, that's so recent that as of like yesterday, we couldn't even show it because it didn't exist. No. What have we got there? I got it yesterday in my office. It's built by my <laughs> PhD students. Sorry. 
Uh, this is a device we manufacture in our lab. Uh, we work with microsystems, and this, uh, this device is actually it's a, it's a proto second generation prototype, and it's going to become a, a measurement tool, point of care measurement tool for influenza. So the idea is that patients will breathe in here and will detect whether they have or they don't have influenza. What does it, it just from the from the from the breath from, from the, breath. the breath? Yes, I can see how like that would be very useful for me when I travel. If all the other passengers on the airplane yes. would be checked before I go on board. Yes. <laughs> but, so how does it work? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell too much about that. I'm sorry, but uh, how, how it works? But uh, indeed, indeed, it, it has a number of, of application areas and. Uh, one is, of course, a, a patient at the doctor's side. Another would be screening of, of uh, people in, in, uh, in, in, in big rooms or entering airplanes. Uh, another would be in the case of pandemics. Uh, mm -hmm. But this kind of technology is really, I would say, driven by how much are you willing to pay for a test like this. And that really depends from situation to situation. You know? If you have a normal flu epidemic, then if you come with a cough to the doctor, the doctor knows you have influenza. He doesn't need to measure it. He doesn't want to pay for this technology. But if you would have like the, the real... The, the, like the, the, the in, in pandemic of influenza where one third of the, pay, of the people died and everybody wants to have it, of course. And then, mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really what is the cost economics behind such a tool and how to use it, and that's driving the technology. But the, te extent. the technology exists now, more um, or less. No, this is a prototype. <laughs> it's not working yet. I wish it was, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, when, will we, when can I go for my breathalyzer flu test? Um... Well, that depends indeed whether you have a pandemic. Or if, if there's a pandemic would be starting tomorrow, then I think we've got a lot of money in this project. <laughs> I think we can speed up the research quite a lot. Let's <laughs> see how this is working now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about DNA, uh, and of course everybody's, everybody's even, even laymen like me have been following the project that has to do with DNA mapping. But now DNA seems to be a little bit yesterday's news. And Susan, I would, I would ask you, just for those in the audience who perhaps uh, think of protein mainly as steak, uh, what is, very briefly, what is a protein? Right, but pr proteins, we, we eat proteins because we need to make our own. We need to break them down and, and, and make our own. Proteins are, are, are basically us. Uh, the DNA is the code for life. Mm -hmm. And if you, for those of you who, who out there who can remember cassette tapes and tape players, uh, it's very much like the, the tape. Uh, it, uh, it very, very complicated, complicated instructions for life. Uh, but it actually itself looks pretty simple and not all that interesting. But when you put it into that tape player, uh, this extraordinary complexity and richness of music comes out of it. And, and that's basically the, what, what's playing the tape and what is the music itself is, is really proteins. And so our DNA codes for thousands and thousands of different proteins and proteins uh, make uh, power our muscles, they digest our food, they harvest the light in our eyes and send signals to our brain so we can interpret it. They basically do everything that we think about as, as, a, as part of our, of our lives. And um, getting that uh, code of DNA uh, decoded into functioning thousands and thousands of different proteins, that's really what's been driving my research for the past 25 years or so. So... We know it works most of the time because here we are, but we don't know exactly how. Yeah, it's really quite extraordinary. You, could, you can think of the nature of the problem sort of as if you were to, to try to assemble a musical orchestra and you would have, you started out with a whole bunch of sheets of metal and you had to fold them very, very precisely and mold them and bulge them out in certain places in order to make a musical instrument and you had to make lots of those musical instruments. And then the way life works is that they're all crowded together <laughs> in an incredibly dense space and they're moving around all the time and, and, and yet they have to, they have to, this orchestra has to work and, and produce this extraordinary thing which, which we call life. Um, and so quite often, unfortunately, uh, that process winds up getting a little chaotic and going astray and that can happen just when, with aging, uh, proteins start to, to misbehave and, and clump up and not do what they're supposed to do or it can happen with genetic mutations. Uh, as uh, we were talking just a moment ago, having this, this bank of tissues from all these human beings now where we're sequencing these genomes and finding uh, problems in the DNA code that can lead to, to um, uh, this orchestra not working. So and, is, uh, is, would and, that be... And, 
Pardon? So, sorry, would that be, you mentioned protein folding before, so if it folds oh. wrong, is that what happens is yeah, you can when protein breaks? if you have breaks. even one inch musical instrument in an orchestra, that the, 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 the person who was making that trombone didn't get it quite right, and it, it could really ruin the whole orchestra. Mm. Uh, and um, that, that, that basically is the, a way in which uh, mutations in gen genetic code can, can lead to terrible diseases, but even just wear and tear and aging can lead to problems in those, in those instruments. Mm. And, um, and really, probably about half of all major diseases that beset mankind, and we, we mentioned neurodegenerative diseases, because Gunnar, Gunnar opened with this beautiful, uh, this beautiful frontier of neuro, neurobiology, but uh, most cancers are caused by by mutations that cause proteins to not be behaving properly, and they signal, "Let's grow, let's to the tumor, let's grow, grow, grow." At times when they shouldn't. Uh, yeah. Many infectious diseases are are actually um, very, very tied closely to the, the the realm of protein folding world as well. That's really interesting. Johan, you're also part of a, a large international team working on the creation of a human protein atlas. So the aim is to systematically map the human proteome. Can you tell us why this started? I mean, we're, we have a clue now baby, from Susan, of course. And, and what development, what, what discoveries has this project made since the start? So, I mean, of course, it started as a follow-up to the um, yeah, work on the human genome, which was first drafted, I think, in 2001. So, uh, and following to that, of course, the information that was generated led to, of course, new possibilities, and that is to, to map out all the proteins that are actually uh, encoded in the genome. And I think it was about 2003 that Matthias Alain sat together with uh, colleagues and thought about, okay, how can we systematically approach the discovery or the, the analysis of all proteins in the human body? And that is basically by producing antibodies against the protein encoding genes. So by uh, 2005, uh, the first version of the Human Protein Atlas, which is a public portal that everybody outside this room and uh, yeah, in the whole world of science can look into where proteins are expressed in the body, in which tissue, and eventually to, to investigate how protein expression changes, for instance, in disease such as cancer. So of course, one of the major questions is, is, is every protein expressed in every cell? So at the moment, our understanding is that the vast majority of proteins are actually expressed in every cell. So there are very few uh, yeah, tissue-specific uh, proteins that are found. So of course, that then leads to following questions. So what does it mean mechanistically? So every cell has a certain function. So, and of course, what does it imply for diseases? And I really like uh, Susan's analogy with the orchestra, but maybe I want to add one because that's what I usually use when I talk to students, and, I, and, and especially friends outside science, and is using the analogy with medieval cities. You know, you have, a, you have the wall, you have kind of the inner city, you have a church, and in the basement of the church, there's a plan for the whole city, how it's supposed to be built, where should be the bakery, where should be the mill, where should be, I don't know, that gate, that tower. And I think just to see the DNA as this plan, and somebody has to go to the DNA to read it and to say, okay, we need bricks to build this, this hospital, or we need to build a, a new um, um, power plant, or mitochondria, as science calls it, is, of course, fascinating because it means communication, interaction, and who tells who what to do what. And I think this is really, of course, not a static information, and I guess uh, many agree that the genome is not static either, but of course the proteome, which is the, the sum of all proteins, is of course much more active and changes, and is of course also responding to the environment a lot. Right, you can imagine if that medieval town was, every building was actually on, on wheels and they were all moving around. It's not just the people moving around, but all the, all the buildings were moving around and the walls were being moved. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's in, life is just this incredibly active uh, environment where, where making things happen, part of what drives life is the fact that it's so active. I'm, I'm starting but, to understand uh, that even the process of, of thinking about these things has to do about zooming into the sort of right distance yes. mentally. Gunnar von Heine, your uh, work combines computational biology with cell membrane proteins, and, and I'm starting to understand that, that the mass of things happening here is so complicated that you might need some, some big computation tools. So what, is, what kind of things is your laboratory bringing to the table? What kind of knowledge? So I think I can connect to, the, to, to this idea or model of, of the cell as a, as a medieval city with a wall around it. And, and we're particularly interested in the proteins, you know, Susan's proteins, but the ones that sit in this wall. You could say the gate proteins, the, the guys that let things in and out. Um, and we're, we're very much basic science. We're just trying to understand more and more about these, these wall proteins, the, these membrane proteins, and how 
how they get, you know, how do you put a wall in, how do you put a gate into the wall? You know, you have to open it up somehow when you put the gate there. That's one, one area that we're trying to understand. And, and, and in doing this, we can also start using genomic information or the pr protein information that's something like the Human Protein Atlas brings to the table um, and trying to predict aspects of these gate proteins, these membrane proteins. What do they look like? How do they fold into a defined shape mm. and sometimes misfold? Um, as in Susan's case, uh, okay. how do they work? This, this is fascinating. And I, I, I do understand that research is inevitably often, very often focused on the next publication or the next funding deadline or, or something like that. But if we, if we try to, to go back to that sort of, sort of view of the whole valley, what would you say is the ultimate goal here of, of life science research in general, and, and especially, of course, I guess the tech side. I mean, this is a big question, admittedly, but, but what are we trying to achieve here? Well, I think that by, by understanding how life works, and this, we, 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 first of all, it's the most extraordinary intellectual question I can ever imagine being privileged enough to, to engage in. It's just fantastic. How does this life work? But I, I think, from my viewpoint, really, what I see amongst my colleagues is, is this real determination that through this extraordinary process of discovery, we're really going to be able to solve some of the really terrible problems that mankind is facing. And I, I think that that's, that's really, that, you know, that really is on the horizon. I mean, developing newer, better vaccines, infectious organisms are, are, are we've conquered them briefly, but it, that's not necessarily going to last for long. The capacity of systems to, of biological systems to evolve doesn't mean that we're really safe from in, infectious disease, but uh, it, it's not, it, every sort of aspect of human biology and development, um, giving, giving every person on this world who is born at some time uh, the we will we will have I, I think within our grasp the, the capacity to give them longer healthier and, and more fulfilling lives. Okay, um, I, I read a lot of science fiction. We're not talking about eternal life though. No, no. <laughs> but longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But, uh, both. Well, I don't know if it's indeed longer life. I, uh, this is actually a, a political question that you have to ask. What is what is good life and what like when we look in medicine, what is the, what is the aim of medicine? Um, if I talk, I hear many people describe, I don't know if this is a, an official view of the state, I don't know if there's such a thing, but I hear many people say, yes, we want to have a long life, and then once we get sick, we want to go fast and painless and have a quick death. Mm -hmm. So maybe, is that an ideal life? I don't know. But is it, I mean, do, do you guys ever think about these things? Yes. Do you think about the longer perspective? What are you working for? Yeah, you're yes. kind of nodding. Yeah, yeah? Absolutely, I think, I mean, this is what I think all of us drives us in the back of our heads, even though it's not so obvious on a daily basis. I mean, if we look at protein, sequences, structures, or at building microsystems. Of course, that's not really like, oh yeah, uh, what we want to aim for, but it's okay, taking the small steps. But sometimes, I don't know, if you, if you take a walk on the, uh, on the beach or in the forest, you think about things, okay, what am I actually doing here? Uh, and, and sometimes, of course, you know, that's, okay, I'm working on a good thing because I'm trying to help to understand, to provide a little piece of the big puzzle that we all are looking at. And I think I want to pick up one thing that Walter said and it's discussed is, is of course, what is healthy? I mean, what is life quality? Mm. And who's normal, right? And I think this is a very important aspect, especially for my research, because we usually deal with people that are not healthy, that have a specific disease, but then we compare them to some other people that, in this regard, are considered as normal but, or healthy, but are they? Is this really something that's important? So what, what makes the fine distance, uh, difference between healthy and diseased, and when can we def define somebody as not healthy? And I think um, at least our work, and I mean bringing together you know, different people from different aspects and perspectives of science, is really the challenge to, to, uh, to make something that improves life quality, because that's, I think, the aim of everyone, to have a good life, and to have a, a, yeah, a life that you can uh, live this race is. I think, I think um, yeah. uh, one of the, the things, and to, to, to actually uh, turn back to something Gunnar said earlier, was that evolution happened and, and life evolved from simpler forms. And our, our understanding of that process has really just grown extraordinarily. And, and one of the things I'm trying to do is to uh, recognizing that this problem of protein folded, which causes so many diseases, is really very ancient. It's part of the initial fabric of life. And, and really harnessing this, this new knowledge of evolutionary processes that we've gotten from genome sequencing 
to to understand how how uh, how the protein folding problem can plays out to so many different types of diseases, and, and connecting with all of these these. Um, these different technologies, I find that it's really present in my mind all the time. You know, what, what eventually can we use this knowledge to to help people live live better lives? And I, I think that often, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of scientists being portrayed in a lot of different movies in which we're we're uh, mad and want to control the world. And it's it's truly not the way I see things in in science these days. I really see. Uh, my colleagues uh, and my students and all, all, all over the globe when I, I travel and go to meetings, people really care about making a difference in this world. Gunnar is, is laughing and nodding. Yes, no, I mean, uh, I, I definitely agree. But, but there is one sort of interesting aspect, I think, of science, which is that even if, you, if you're not driven by, you know, by, by bettering the lot of mankind or something, um, even if you're only driven by the intellectual curiosity, yeah. in the long run, your work is going to benefit Absolutely. mankind. Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's a great invention of science, actually, <laughs> that you can, uh, you can funnel even just curiosity-driven research but, into the, in this way. But now we're saying mankind. Uh, do, we, do we really just mean sort of the global north and whoever can afford, afford it? Or are we talking about once this knowledge is out there, we're going to be able to, to use it to counteract social injustice and these kinds of things. You're all, you're all nodding now. I was thinking you were going to say, no, unfortunately, this is only for rich people. So, so how is this going to help everybody? I mean, the world is growing and it's a number of people. So, I mean, that not only means that there are more to take care of, but also that we are moving closer together, just I mean, simply because we expand in size. And now with modern technologies, with transportation, things are not like, so stable in some terms of that they stay at one specific uh, region or area. So we all, I think, are connected somehow. I mean, uh, I think the influenza uh, um, that kind of broke out a couple of years back, she clearly showed that you cannot just, just say, oh, those people you know, over there, they have this and this problem. That will not happen to me. Mm. So, so I think it's, it's, we should be you know, caring about everyone in, in, in a sense. You know, yeah. Of course, yeah. it's well, not possible, but, yeah. uh, yeah. but at least... Ha technology has a, has a big role to play here. I mean, we talk about life science and you talk about biology but on the other side of life science is medical technology. It's a really big part of life sciences. And, and um, yes. actually what we're trying to do a lot within medical technology, for example, with the microsystem we're building, is really bring the medical technology to a very low cost so that it can re really that the inventions you're doing in SciLife Lab can be brought to medical practice at a low enough cost that you can have it actually also in a, in a third world setting. Gunnar, right. there's, there's just a, a moment, Susan. Interesting, yeah. more people on this earth have died of malaria than, than all other diseases combined. And uh, many, it's, it's one of the great killers in our modern world, and it's, it affects primarily the disadvantaged nations, not, not our northern yeah. developed world. But I, I, one of the exciting things is, is that uh, in, in this town where I am uh, working, I'm connecting up with all kinds of people who are studying malaria. And what their what their goal really is to do, and it, it, it actually I, it, I intersect with them just a little bit because of, of some of the issues of protein folding. But one, one of their goals is to be able to to cure malaria with something that's going to be cost pennies. Because unless you can get a, a dose of, a, of an anti-malarial that and make manufacture it for the, for really the cost of, of, of a dime or so, uh, it's it's not going to going to help the, the third world. But People are really focusing on trying to do that. In, in the last few weeks, uh, at least here in Sweden, and uh, there's, there's been a lot of media attention around biohacking. So that would be interested amateurs in home-built laboratories getting into DNA analysis, virus design, and so on. And I guess this is based on the idea that, that biological programming is not very unlike computer programming and that these skills uh, should be available to all. How do you guys feel about this amateur competition? Um, you know, what brings, what this brings to my to my mind is is, you know, when I was a teenager, those of us who were who were geeks, who were nerds, science nerds, we had a dark room in the basement, and we were doing you know developing films, and we were mixing chemicals and stuff. It's a bit similar, I think. Uh, you know, it's it's today's nerds, and and it's great. It's mm -hmm. great that we have these nerds that do these things. Um, I'm not sure if the, you know, if that, if biohacking, in principle, they can do more things than we could do in a, in a dark room, both good and bad. But um, I think it's today's teenage nerds, basically, and they will be good scientists uh, in 10 years' time. 
They were going to be can, good scientists. Susan. I can remember that when I, went, when I was a teenager, I desperately wanted a chemistry set. I wanted it so much. And I, as a girl, I was not given a chemistry <laughs> set. I was given a, instead a little baking set. But, uh, but I, I, I really do feel that, that having people be able to engage with what life science is, having young people around the world being able to think about biological experiments and be excited about them, I, I think I think it's 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 to me. I don't think of it in any way as competition. I think of it as a very exciting way to engage people in this this glorious thing of how life works. I, I have to say, of course, it seems from the coverage that the national security organizations all over the world are quite worried uh, about I, I think, this. But I think it is. I think there, I think that's not without foundation that there should be some some concern uh, uh, for that. I, I I'm more concerned about. Um, uh, a determined bioterrorist being wanting to use this this knowledge and wanting to tinker than I am really with uh, with teenagers in their basements. Mm. So but really, the problem is well, I mean, the problem, the risk is really from people who have actual uh, knowledge rather than people who are making it up as they as they go I, along. I think it is, but you know, there are unexpected things that can happen. But that's that's where I see the real danger coming from. The, the unexpected things that can happen, and again, I've been watching a lot of movies, but I do have to ask you this question: Is there a real risk that? you guys or somebody of your colleagues somewhere is going to accidentally or even worse on purpose develop something quite lethal and quite dangerous and then that might get stolen or got, might spread or, or do you feel that you're, that you're part of a brotherhood of science or sisterhood of science where, where you have very strong ethical guidelines and you would absolutely never research anything dangerous? Well, I think it's important to recognize also that, that biology is out there doing this all the time. I mean, HIV appeared out of nowhere, right? It's, it was a new epidemic and a terrible scourge. And that happened because organisms were contacting other organisms and exchanging information and exchanging DNA. And this is how life has evolved on this earth. And so I, I really think an awful lot of stuff has been going on. And, 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 uh, and the more we understand how to control that and develop therapeutics for this, I, I think in general, it's, it's the more we know it's going to be for the better. I, yeah. I dearly hope and believe that. I'm still not sure that you should be helping <laughs> nature along in the, down certain paths. The water, what do you say? Yeah, isn't it so that 10% of the human DNA has a viral origin? Or yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, okay, that can show, you translate that, that to a layman? What does that, it mean? That, mean, that means that, um, for example, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's not my specialty area, but if you are exposed long enough to HIV as a human race, I mean, it's going to be maybe part, become part of our genome, and you're not, you don't see it as a disease, it's just part of your natural genome. Yeah. And I think that's how evolution works, basically. Mm. Yes, that's one of the ways in which evolution works, this yeah. exchange of genetic information and viruses hopping around from one organism to another. And uh, there have been, it, it, there's really an extraordinary amount of biology that's happening out there all of the time. Actually, mm. one, one major threat I would say is not, uh, that we're seeing now is not, uh, is not people trying to make viruses, but it's uh, antibiotic resistance. And us in industry, for example, feeding antibiotics to our cows, that then end up to antibiotic resistance that is spreading. And that is a real big problem nowadays, antibiotic resistance of gram-negative bacteria. Mm. Good enough. Yes, no, I agree. And that uh, is bioterrorism. Um, no, no, I don't it, know. It, it, <laughs> in some sense. <laughs> Nature okay. is much better than us at you know, inventing these bad, uh, for us, bad things. Yeah. But there's still, something, there's still something about this, like that there are certain usages and things that, that, that are sort of becoming systemic and, and normalized. I mean, uh, um, genetic selection in children, we are, we're, we're again, it's about what is normal, and, but we are making these kinds of choices increasingly uh, where, where it is available. It's, it's of course, frowned upon uh, terribly and, and with good reason when, when the method is selective abortion. That's absolutely horrible, but, it's, but a lot of the same people who, would be, who are judging this uh, or condemning, uh, condemning this are, are, are looking with great interest at the possibilities of, of, of uh, selecting away certain tra traits in their own children uh, at, an, at an earlier, at an earlier well, stage. I think that the, the truth of the matter is that all progress comes with is, is there's associated good and bad with it. And, uh, it, and the, what's frightening to people now, I think, is that the pace seems to be accelerating so much more. I mean, this is this, the, the rate at which our, our lives are, are really different from the lives our parents led uh, is extraordinary. And my children are now uh, using electronic technology that I can't. I can't figure out how to work. So, uh, you know, I, I think I think that's happening all over, and our lives are being transformed. And one one has to has to really have have hope, but also be as vigilant as we can be, that we use it for the best possible purposes. We okay. Can. In that case, can I ask you a really personal question? 
you don't have to answer, but like, have you ever, have you ever been at a moment in your own research where, where you've looked at something or re realized something and gone, wow, this could really be used in a bad way as well? I'm not going to go there, but it might. Have, uh, have you yes. been in that situation? Gunnar is nodding. Yeah, Susan as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you would uh, analyze a sample of a patient and you find something that at your kind of the moment you look at it, uh, uh, excited by the discovery, you know, extrapolate this could mean that this person has this and this disease. Of course, this is frightening in a way because you have yet no proof. Mm. So uh, I think it's it's I, I think every knowledge um, is linked to responsibility. So if we have the knowledge of today. Uh, like you said, uh, you know, if we, if we look at our children before they're born to kind of say, okay, we want to have them because they are kind of you know, bulletproof in terms of they have every piece that they need mm -hmm. to, to grow up and be an adult, I think that comes with a responsibility to see, okay, what does it really mean for us and for our society and for the, for the world? So I think it's, it's not only just generating knowledge, but it's also, you know, seeing the value and the power it has. I think we have a question now from a, Skype, a Skyper in Pakistan, I think. Do we have you online? Hello? Hello, yes, I can uh, hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. What is your name, please? Uh, it's uh, Rana Manavar Farooq from Pakistan, and uh, basically I'm uh, from the field of education. I'm principal of the school, as well as I'm a student of political sciences. Welcome. So what I is your question? Uh, uh, my question is this, that... Uh, we are having many Down syndromes in our societies. So can we cure these Downs uh, before pregnancy or after birth? Okay, thank you very much for this question. Uh, so what do we, are we saying? Down syndrome. I, I have to say that there are, of course, many people who feel that this shouldn't be, that this is a condition that doesn't need curing, but there are, again, a lot of suffering connected to it that many parents certainly would uh, want to prevent. Can we cure or prevent Down syndrome? Gunnar is nodding. No? As far as I know, we cannot cure it, but mm. I may be wrong. It's, uh, yeah. It can be diagnosed, of yeah. course, uh, at, uh, at early during pregnancy. But mm -hmm. I mean, it, uh, it means that we interfere in a process that yeah. is so powerful. I mean, the growth of an embryo into a, young, into a small baby is, I mean, such a powerful event. So many things happen, exploding in terms of the size in a very short amount of time. So the question is, if we would change a small little detail, what would be the consequence? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very difficult, at least from my understanding, to predict what, what the outcome would be. So exactly, I should say we, what we're talking about here, of course, is chromosome, chromosome right. design, right? Yeah. And that's not going to be happening anytime, anytime soon, right. nor perhaps should it. Susan? The problem with Down syndrome is that there's there's uh, the the embryo gets started with a whole extra large chunk of genetic information. So, it's really an incredibly complex disease. There are th a thousand genes on that chromosome, and so it's not just one protein going wrong. It's it's an, an imbalance between hundreds and hundreds of proteins. So that is just something we can't begin to tackle at the moment. And whether we ever could, I don't know. Um, but this is a, this is the where things cross over into the into diagnostics and difficult questions of whether abortions should be allowed, difficult questions of whether um, uh, earlier and earlier diagnosis or uh, just informing people of the of the risk. Uh, they're, 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 this is hit on a, a really uh, difficult biological problem and, and therefore also a very difficult ethical one. Yes. Thank you. Do we, I'm also opening for questions from the audience, if anyone should have one, or do we have another one on Skype? How are we on that? Here, please, uh, move to the microphone, please, and state your name. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my question is, I'm a master's student, when I look at the peer review journals, the, the best ones in the business, I get to see a lot of exciting stuff that's being published in, the pa in these papers. But my question is, what are the challenges that scientists are facing to, bring the, uh, to take these interesting ideas and their inventions on a commercial scale? And what are the difficulties in taking them into a commercial use? Thank you. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Who wants to begin? Walter? Well, <laughs> You're sitting there with the prototype, so we start yes. with you. <laughs> well, I think, uh, for example, you, you, you investigate a new biomolecule, a biomarker, and you see it has to do with one or another disease. But uh, I think biological processes, as you have mentioned before, are often so complex that 
changing one marker that you find, and you know you have to understand what is the entire role of this marker and how does it collaborate with any all the other biological processes. And this is where, where it very often very quickly fails, I think, because it, it shows up. It's never only one marker. The world is so much more complex that you that you very often you, you fail immediately while trying to use that marker for something. Yeah. I think that's a major failure point. The transition of, of science and, and academic laboratories and, and make it really matter out in the real world, I think it's a, it's a brilliant question because it's really one of the, the great dilemmas of our time, I think. The, the, the funding mechanisms that we, we have had traditionally in place to do this with venture capitalists investing in what looks like a good idea, and that, that idea usually plays out in a couple of years, and either the either company either works or it, or it goes bust. Well, a lot of the ideas that need to be translated now are going to take a much longer time frame to to get them translated, and so the dilemma of how do we how do we take this new knowledge and make it really matter in the real world in commercial products is is an extraordinarily important one. It seems to me that the, that the expansion is such that it, it's clear, and also, of course, the, the need for resources for testing and so on is, is so vast that it's not going to happen uh, in academic context. Uh, basic research, I hope, will still be funded, but a lot of this will have to be funded uh, commercially. You, can, you were saying? Yeah, I think the, the, the sad aspect is there needs to be a market for something like this. I mean, whatever the discovery is, if there's no market, nobody will buy it. So then, of course, every brilliant idea is, is lost halfway. Another problem is, of course, that Discoveries are often made on a small scale in an isolated environment. Let's say a certain population is being screened for a certain disease, and of course, the excitement really arises because it's a new uh, finding that's connected, uh, for instance, a genome to a disease status. But of course, if we would put it on a more global scale, we need to involve more players, more uh, ethnicities, more people. And of course, that is usually, at least for in my field, kind of the, the, the real challenge that people face. It's discovery is easy and exciting, but a verification is so difficult. And of course, that is the challenge because that needs new technologies, needs a better understanding of the molecules, how they fold, how they interact. And I think then to integrate all the different disciplines into achieving a, a better understanding and eventually something that, that mankind can benefit from is, is key. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question now that may be unanswerable, but would you, at what point do you think a researcher should leave the academic sphere? Or should you stand with one foot in both, always? Both you stand with, with one foot in both. Basically, if we do research, I mean, either you have a great scientific paper, but if, if you want to bring that further, either you have to go to technology, you have to either get a patent or you have to outlicense the technology or give it for free to a company or you have to start a company yourself if you want something to do with that. And I think, I think we have an obligation to do that, to bring it a step further. Mm -hmm. I think more and more academics are doing that. I've started a company uh, myself, and it, it was a, su a successful one, but it was really not easy. <laughs> and I, I, I think academics need to gain an appreciation of how translating something into a real commercial world and something that actually works and the complexities of, of trying to find a compound that will, will uh, fix a certain disease in a, in a test tube in, a, in addition to laboratory versus actually getting something that works in a human being and it lasts in the body and isn't excreted and doesn't mm -hmm. have like, extra toxicities. It's really an incredibly complex problem. And I think trying to understand, I, I think it's really uh, been a transformation in, in, in my professional life in, in science has been, when I, when I started out in science, I'd never even dreamt of, of trying to do something like that. And mm -hmm. Now I think more and more academics, at least the ones I see around me, are really trying to make that effort. And um, I think trying to find ways that will, that will ease that path and um, educate them on how best to do it is, is going to be a very important aspect of, of well, future science development. education as well. Gunnar? Yes. I'd also like to put in a plug for, for basic science. I don't think every scientist has to have one foot in each camp. I think some scientists should. Some scientists should be more on you know, the applied it side. It depends on your personality. Uh, it whether depends you're on personality, depends on interest and everything, where you can make the greatest difference. You know. mm. um, but we have probably been separating the two, the two camps too much. Uh, yeah. And they need to be brought together, but not each person. It, it does seem that the, that the sort of questionability, it used to be if you're in, if you're in, uh, if you're in, please go ahead. It, it used to be that if you are in, uh, if you're in, involved in a commercial venture, you're, you're becoming somehow suspicious as a scientist. That's disappeared entirely, I feel. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Mario Romero. I'm from KTH. And um, thank you for organizing this. I want to veer the conversation for maybe a few minutes towards autism. I'm reading the CDC report from March 
this year. And the prevalence has increased to 2%. So that's one in 50 children, six to 17 years old. If you consider that autism is a lifelong condition, and you also consider that depending on the severity, there may be many adults per child dedicated to that child's life, and then what happens after that child reaches adulthood. It's sort of a big, what Wooder was saying, it's, it starts to look like, like um, an epidemic. Mm. So the, the question is, well, really, I, wanna, I, I just want to sort of have a conversation, but the question is, or one of the questions is, what is the advancement in biomarkers for autism? And um, early detection and intervention for autism? And um, why is the prevalence going so high? Is it a matter of is it a matter of a change in diagnosis? Is it a political matter to get access to resources from uh, insurance, um, or is there a combination of genetic and contextual factors that are triggering the disease? Thank you, Mario, and thank you, thank you for the sort of. Uh, broad uh, approach on this, and of course now, if none of you have a specific uh, specialty in autism, uh, we, you feel free also to approach this this question on a sort of higher higher level. But well, immediately, if we start with it, does anyone have? I think have, have yeah? something I could say about it. Um, I I think uh, it, there is. Uh, no question now, the, the thought that maybe we're just diagnosing it better was out there for quite a while, but I think there's no question now that, that it is on the rise, it is increasing. And uh, we don't understand why. Um, it may be because of, uh, and is very likely, uh, an intersection between uh, environmental factors, uh, poten potentially some viruses we don't know about. They're, 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 it's a great question that is occupying a very great many people right now. And I, I think um, an example of, of, of what I find an inspiring sort of uh, approach on this is um, uh, th there's a center here at MIT which was uh, funded recently by a philanthropist who made a great deal of money. He's very concerned about this problem. So he set up a, an institute here uh, to study autism. And uh, what, what I find really inspiring about the way that has been done is that they're not only trying to, um, to find biomarkers and, and figure out how you do diagnose it, they're, they're, they're really approaching it from the standpoint of the basic science problem. You know, what goes wrong when nerves are not connected to each other quite right, when they're not mm. talking with each other quite properly? And they're even using very, very simple organisms to try to try to probe what's going on. And, 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 and I, I really love the fact that it's, it's bringing together people from all sorts of different disciplines, the geneticists and, and chemists and uh, brain scientists. And uh, I, I think that's an example of it. It, it. it also connects to the question that was asked about how do you translate technology? Mm. And I think sometimes... Having um, someone with vision who says, I'm, I'm willing to fund this high risk, potentially high payoff endeavor uh, amongst a, a wide group of people who are doing different things. Uh, and that doesn't happen all the time, unfortunately, yeah. but it, it, it can happen. And I think it's inspiring when it does. Very briefly, do, do any of you others have, have input on this? Dare to I mean, it's, speculate? It's, a, it's yeah. of course, a, a, a good example of uh, you know something becoming very, very obvious and very kind of, um, let's say, uh, challenging to face because uh, when, when, do, when do you kind of start looking for a marker? How do you start looking for a marker? Who, which are the tools you want to use? I mean, there are so many entry points into this question and into kind of finding the right solution for it that it, it's, of course, challenging at, at one point. But I think the most important thing is that the first seed is planted, said there is a problem we need to face and we need to put our heads together and we need to find the best possible solution for, for helping the child, for those children or for helping parents that are planning to have children or look into certain environments. I think uh, that there's so many aspects that, have, of course, need to come together and, and to find the right strategy for it. So I think the important thing already happened that you know, people are concerned and, and, and observant. They say, mm -hmm. okay, this is happening, we need to do something about it. And then, of course, there are gazillions of ways of approaching it. And um, yeah, I'm not an expert in this field either, but I can only hope that, yeah, the, the, the smart heads in the world find the motivation to build smarter groups for, for tackling that disease. And it, it does seem that a lot of the things we've touched upon, that is going to be the answer, getting people from different fields working sure. together. We're running out of time, so I have one final question. Could each of you mention one problem 
that humanity is very close to solving. Let's say, I don't know what very close means in your field, but perhaps, let's say, maybe 10 years, something along those lines. Very, very briefly. From my point of view, as a basic scientist, I, I think it's kind of an ill-posed question. Is, is what we consider a problem today, we will not consider a problem tomorrow. And, you know, the, the whole idea of the problem is evolving all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we could, you know, even put a you know, stamp on a, on a timeline and say, okay, problem solved. Because I, by that time, the problem is different. After so. this answer, I'm not sure it's possible to, to, possible to do any of you, any a disease? Yeah, Walter, I, briefly. I, I talk from a medical technology point of view, and I can see some of the trends coming within the next 10 years. And uh, talking about my own field of microsystem, we, we're coming to a, uh, to a system where people can, will be able to diagnose themselves more in, in the home setting. And... Um, so that's going to change perhaps medicine and make it more cost efficient and maybe better. So this, these are definitely trends that we're seeing and that's going to change. Right. I, I, think, yeah. I think there's been a lot of hype about personalized medicine, yeah. but I, I do think it's real and it's going to be empowered by not just uh, being able to sequence our DNA. I mean, it, it cost a billion dollars to sequence the first human genome and now it costs a, a few thousand. Mm. In that uh, case. And, <laughs> <laughs> but but, but that's, that's only one of the things we have to do in terms of identifying what's the basic cause of certain diseases. Then you have to find the chemical compounds that are going to combat it. And I, I think that that is a new horizon. It will, it will lead to some very exciting new things in the future in the next 10 years. Thank you so much. Both van der Weyenhardt, Gunnar von Heine, Jochen Schwenk and Susan Lindquist. We'll be back on the hour with the cities of the future.